So good morning and welcome to Business Over Breakfast. I'm Nicola Barrett, uh, Chief Corporate Learning Officer at Emory Executive Education at Goizueta Business School. I hope you've got your coffee and your questions because um, I hope, hopefully this is going to be a really um, interesting session. I know it's going to be. But before I introduce our faculty guide, I wanted to share something that we started to explore about this time last year. And that is the question of growth. You know, how does growth happen? Where does it come from? At what fuels it? Can it be achieved in a consistent and sustainable way? Or do you just have to get lucky? Um, and can you teach people to be growth agents? We talked to faculty, we talked to practitioners and conducted market research. And what resulted is a belief that you can teach people to be growth leaders. But as today's technologies and societies changed expectations are both disrupting and uh, creating opportunities for business, the rules of strategy and engagement are being rewritten. And this demands new mindsets, enhanced capabilities, new disciplines, new business models, and new business structures. While organizations must protect and enhance their core business, they must also find new demand side growth opportunities. And this requires you to create a new playbook, increase your repertoire of opportunities, innovate, iterate, and invest fast to capture new white space and create solutions that customers will love and importantly, reward you for. And this doesn't just happen. It requires intentionality to, to develop those capabilities and elevate your game. This is why we are developing what we're calling a Growth Leadership Academy that develops your abilities to see opportunity, design offerings with a market edge, unlock demand, and lead growth efforts. The Academy is a six-month virtual learning journey that combines assessments, masterclasses, workshops, and learning labs led by faculty, uh, like our guide uh, today, David uh, Schweidel, and others that you've seen on Business Over Breakfast, like Omar Rodriguez, and master executive practitioners, uh, two of whom you have also seen on Business Over Breakfast, uh, Francisco Crespo, the ex-chief growth officer at the Coca-Cola company, uh, Rebecca Messina, who was the chief marketing officer at Uber, um, and both are now um, strategy advisors at um, large uh, consulting uh, firms, where the academy is where learners, your future growth leaders, can assess where they are today in terms of their growth leadership capabilities, are exposed to new knowledge, methods, and frameworks for seeing, organizing, and inspiring growth, get their hands dirty by playing with these models and approaches, and build their growth muscles through small experiments in their organizations. At the end of this journey, they will have developed their personalized growth playbook and have created a fellow um, growth leaders uh, network in the community of practice. And you can find out more about this on our website, but I did want to let you know about this because it's a, it's a, a very new um, uh, venture for us and built on um, extensive, extensive research. Today, we're going to offer a sort of another peek into some of the uh, powerful approaches and latest thinking for igniting growth as we welcome back uh, Goizueta faculty member, David Schweidel to Business Over Breakfast to focus on driving growth through content analysis. David is a professor of marketing and an expert in the areas of social media analytics, customer relationship management, and data-driven strategies, all key areas for driving growth um, and, and uh, demand-side growth in organizations. His research focuses on the development and application of statistical models to understand customer behavior, and inform decisions. Words are part of almost every marketplace interaction, but how do you as a leader best use this data and also visuals and audio? Today, David's going to examine how analytical methods can be applied to content involving social media and search engine optimization and exploring how this can drive growth. As with most sessions, David is going to spend about 30, 35 minutes sharing his expertise on leveraging content uh, analysis as a growth engine 
and this will be followed by a live Q&A session. So please enter your questions in the Q&A box and we will do our best to get to as many questions as possible. So good morning, David, over to you. Thanks a lot, Nicola, and thanks everyone for joining this morning. Uh, I'm gonna get my screen shared so that you guys can see uh, the same thing I have. And I've got the chat window uh, open so that I can take questions. If you have some, a question uh, relevant to the content that I'm talking about in a particular time, um, I'll do my best to address those questions as uh, they come up. Um, but as Nicola mentioned, what I wanted to talk with you about today is the idea of content analytics and how that relates to growth. And just to kind of ground us, to give you an idea of what we're gonna be talking about, um, if you were anything like me during the pandemic, you ended up streaming a lot of content over platforms like Hulu, Netflix, uh, Amazon Prime. And today what we're seeing in the media space is the, you know, the new streaming wars with Disney Plus, HBO Max, um, all, of the, all of the content providers offering their content online on demand. And one of the big questions that they grapple with is, well, how do we decide what content we're gonna put up there. Well, what they're engaged in is a form of content analytics to say, based on the data that we have, can we get a sense for how popular our content is going to be? And in their case, the revenue model is based around subscriptions. So how do I link what I know about my content to the tendency for people to subscribe? And as one of my colleagues, uh, Dan McCarthy has talked about in a previous business over breakfast session, how do we connect that to our subscription revenue? Yeah, to, yeah as far as, the general nature of the outline for today. I want to talk about first, just to ground us in um, what, it, what do I mean by unstructured data versus structured data? Um, and these are some terms that have become popular in this era of big data. But once we kind of ground ourselves with that, we're going to talk through some of the opportunities that we've identified through some of our research. And of course, even though we've got opportunities, doesn't necessarily mean that that's something that we want to engage. And so what are the caveats that we have to keep in mind uh, when it comes to leveraging content analytics from a growth standpoint? All right, so let's dive into things. So what do I mean by unstructured data? As Nicola mentioned, my background is statistics. And typically when we think of statistics, we think of a bunch of numbers. You know, I'm, I can take my spreadsheet or my database, I can look at what marketing levers like price might relate to subscription growth or sales growth. Well, the majority of the data that we're dealing with today actually doesn't take on that numeric form. Most of the data that we're dealing with is what's referred to as unstructured data or non-numeric data. You know, so if we think of structured data as anything that's a number, unstructured data is everything else. So that might be the text that we put into social media posts. It might be the text that we put into our marketing communications. Uh, it could be images that we use in our marketing communications. It could be the, pic as I mentioned, the pictures that we take, we're starting to see interest in the audio of video posts as more and more brands are using videos to engage with their customers and use that to drive traffic and ultimately sales. What can we learn about how people respond to the audio track as well as the videos that they see? So all of this rich media is recorded somewhere. And so what content analytics is largely concerned with is putting some form of structure on these rich media files so that we can then say, I have this content, I've quantified it in some way, and then I've linked that to the metrics that I'm ultimately interested in. Right. So just to give you some examples as to where this arises, uh, one big space where we're seeing this is in the customer communications space. How, yeah, so if we think about things like customer service, whether that's customer service occurring through a chatbot, whether that's a conversation that's happening between a call service uh, representative and a customer, or if it's happening as part of a sales interaction. Uh, yeah, I, I date myself when I use my TV references, but if any of you remember the TV show Lie to Me, uh, that was focused on 
facial expressions. Well, during sales interactions, if we're able to I, capture those facial expressions and then say, all right, well, based on this facial expression, here's what the customer's emotional state is. Let me change the approach that I'm taking right now in terms of that sales interaction um, to be more in line with how they're responding to me. Sales, agents, sales representatives are trained to do this. Right. Now, what we're going to look at is how we may be able to do some of these things at scale, uh, taking it a step further, going beyond customer communications, uh, looking at you know, broader marketing communications. All right. So if we look at advertising, uh, you think about what comprises mm -hmm. an advertisement. And again, I'll date myself because I, like, I used to watch TV when I didn't have children and had a lot more time on my hands. But if you think about a TV commercial, what do we have? We've got a transcript, all right? So we have the words that they're speaking. We have the way in which those words are speaking, the audio track. We have the visuals uh, that are used. So how do I construct an advertisement to make it as effective as possible? You know, I spoke with one of our alums who uh, leads uh, marketing insights for a large CPG manufacturer. And they go through extensive copy testing of all of their advertising internally before it ever sees the light of day. Now, a lot of that involves focus groups, large survey panels in order to gauge responses. But what if we had that data and we could build it at scale so that instead of having to convene those large groups to get responses, what if we could build an algorithm that would give you the same responses uh, that you could expect, the same metrics that you could expect to get from those uh, large groups of consumers? Okay. So that's where content analytics is going to come into play. Uh, there's been a lot of research around firm generated social media posts. How do I design that? ideal post uh, so that I get the like, so that it goes viral, and so that it ultimately drives business. Right? And most of what we've seen already tends to focus on the consumer to consumer interaction space with regards to user generated content. So there's been a lot of work looking at the language that people use. We're starting to see more work relating to the visuals that they use. Uh, and for brands that are engaged in social media listening, that provides a rich opportunity to learn about brand perceptions based on what customers are saying about us. So all of these cases, whether we're generating text, whether we're seeing images generated, whether it's by the brand, whether it's by competitors, uh, whether it's by our consumers directly, all of these provide us with an opportunity to learn about what content is going to work best. Right. So what I wanted to do um, with the bulk of our time, I wanted to spend um, as much time as I could going through where I see uh, specific opportunities to leverage content analytics uh, rather than getting into any, any of the math behind it. I wanted to kind of show you what can we do with this or more specifically, what can we learn and then think through what can we do with it? Uh, so this is the result of research that's ongoing with collaborators at the University of Maryland um, and uh, the Warden Business School. I see a couple of people having some issues with the sound. I'm wondering if it's my headphones, so I'm going to just switch over to, um, a dip to the microphone um, that I've got. Give me just one second to resolve that, guys. Sorry about that. So let me just plug in the mic that I have, and hopefully that'll resolve. Uh, the sound issue. All right, so let's give that a shot. And if it's still continuing to be choppy, guys, please let me know in the chat and uh, we'll try to figure out what's going on. All right, so what we're seeing, it, what we did in this study is we took about 750,000 pieces of, con uh, of content. Uh, you know, things like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, CNBC, uh, as well as popular blogs like technology blogs and lifestyle blogs. And we analyzed that content to see how far into the stories were people reading. And so what we ended up doing was to say, paragraph by paragraph, are people choosing to continue reading past the current paragraph? And 
what we found was there are specific factors in the text that are associated with more reading, and there are specific factors that are associated with less reading. So this graph summarizes uh, the findings from that research. And you can see, for example, that positive emotions, increasing positive emotions by one standard deviation increases uh, the likelihood that in, that consumers complete the article by about seven and a half percent. Increasing the amount of anger that's presented in the text of the article increases completion by about 10%. Uh, features like the amount of anxiety expressed, the familiarity of the language, the concreteness of the language, all associated with increased completion. Now let's look at the flip side. What was associated with people choosing to stop reading sooner? Well, sadness is one dimension. Um, the other dimensions, the fleisch kincaid reading level and the parse tree height, these are different metrics that relate to the complexity of the language. Essentially, the more complex your writing structure, the longer the sentence is, the more um, commas and other punctuation that you have to use, the less likely people were to continue reading. Right. And so what the dashed lines represent here is the change in reading that you could expect if you were to uh, change the focus of the content. And the reason we included those dashed lines on this figure is to show that the way in which you say things, the language that you're using is just as important as what you're talking about. Right? And so if you're putting out marketing copy, it has to be accessible to people. There's no chance for it to be persuasive if they don't finish reading it. And so what that means is we've got to make the language accessible, less complex sentence structures, more familiar words, more concrete words. What we also see is high arousal language tends to be associated with more reading. So anger and anxiety typically marked by higher arousal compared to sadness. So we can think about crafting our content, but then scoring that content say, well, how do we rank on these different dimensions that we know are associated with completion? And the more we complete the text, the more opportunity that we have to persuade readers. Another demonstration just on the impact of language is looking at who's engaged in the conversation. Um, and yeah, if we, th this is an interesting study that I'm glad we were able to, uh, to do. What we had essentially done was said, let's look at a selection of brand crises. Uh, yeah, if you think back to specific um, crises, you might think about um, in recent years, Nike's decision to partner with Colin Kaepernick uh, was very controversial. Nordstrom's decision to drop Ivanka Trump's uh, line of clothing and accessories was considered controversial. Uh, Target had decisions around uh, the presence of transgender bathrooms. Chick-fil-A's owners uh, had come out and made statements against gay marriage. These are all examples of crisis that the brands really didn't have um, complete control over. These were more values related crises. Then we've got crises like product recalls uh, and system failures, like if Delta or I forget which airline it was recently, I think it was Frontiers that had um, computer outages that led to widespread flight cancellations. Um, well, how does that relate to how your consumers are going to respond? You know, um, Chandra, just to your question about the previous study about reading depth, we didn't go into looking at the emotionality of kind of how people responded to the content. That study was just focused on, you know, were they actually consuming the content? But, you know, of course, we don't want to create negative impressions, especially associated with the brand, um, just to get that reading depth. Um, so that's where we've got to be mindful of, yes, people are reading it, but are we getting that desired outcome? All right. So in this study, as I mentioned, we looked at a lot of brands. And what we did was we wanted to see how people who had previously engaged with the brand, uh, you know, what we termed as people with a stronger self-brand connection, how did their language differ from people who hadn't previously 
engaged with the brand. And what you see here in the panel on the left, showing us the use of positive emotions in comments about the brand before any crisis event, they're pretty similar to each other. After the crisis though, what we tended to see was that people who had previously engaged with the brand exhibited some type of brand relationship tended to be more positive than people engaging with the brand for the first time. And again, we see a similar uh, image when we look at the impact or the presence of negative emotions. Uh, if you look at before the event, not much of a difference. In fact, those who had engaged with the brand previously, actually a little bit more critical. Um, whereas after the crisis, less negative emotion coming from the people who had engaged with you. And that's what we would expect. We would expect people who had engaged with us previously to have more loyalty to the brand. And so after a brand has a problem, they're coming to your aid, they're defending you. Um, so more positive language, less negative language compared to what you see from people talking about the brand for the first time. But as we dug a little bit deeper and looked at how, how consumers react to values related crisis versus performance related crisis, we actually see a more nuanced story. Right. So here we have the positive language uh, split by performance and values related crisis. And if we look at the performance related crisis, this is what we saw uh, previously. After the crisis, we have more positive language coming from those individuals with the strong self-brand um, connection. Um, in values related, uh, in the values related crisis, yeah, we see again more positive um, language coming from consumers. It's an even stronger effect. But what happens when we look at those negative emotions? You, you'll notice that we don't see a drop. Uh, after that performance related crisis, whereas again, for the if it's a values related crisis, uh, we do we do see uh, that reduction happening. All right, so depending on who you're looking at, that's going to dictate uh, the inferences that you that you're ultimately going to draw. Uh, so one of the things that uh, yeah, what we're focused on today being growth and one of the big levers that we can put, use for to drive growth is can we use social media content to drive engagement? Uh, you know, my wife just had started working with uh, a local business working on their social media content because they know that they're leaving money on the table by not having a strong social presence. And so what I put up here is uh, ways that you can break down a single social media post. All right, so we can look at the text of the image. And these are two dimensions, positive emotional valence and negative uh, emotional valence. But as we had, uh, looked at earlier, we could break that down further. We could break it down in terms of specific emotions uh, that are being expressed. If we look at the visuals of the image, uh, we can look at the valence being expressed in this case on the face of the individuals who are present uh, in the image. There are other metrics that we can derive from the image. And I'll talk about some of those um, in a moment, but the key with all of these uh, measures is these can be derived using automated tools. Uh, as part of the study that we had, lots and lots of control variables, again, all derived from automated metrics that we can extract. And then as far as looking at, are we driving engagement? Are we picking up uh, more consumers? Are we seeing increased interest? We can look at the responses that are coming in online. So I wanted to share a little bit with you about the tools that we're using here, because this is why we're seeing uh, the interest suddenly in content analytics is faster, more powerful computers allow us to develop more sophisticated uh, tools so that we can derive deeper insights. You know, so here's one type of tool that's becoming very popular is the use of facial recognition. Um, now I wanna draw a distinction between technically what we're doing here is what's referred to as facial detection and facial recognition that you may have heard about in the news when it comes to mass surveillance. When we're doing facial detection, all that we're interested in is, 
Is there a face? And what are the broad characteristics of that face? And so in this case, we can do, we're extracting things like the expression that's on a person's face, the emotion that's being expressed on an individual's face. What we're not doing is linking this to a massive database that's been previously developed so that I can say, here is the particular person that is detected in these images. Well, the, tech, the tools that are out there, uh, what they rely on, I mentioned the TV show Lie to Me earlier, they've taken that idea of facial expressions and taken it to scale. So we look at specific landmarks on the face, eyebrows, corners of the eye, uh, relative to your nose, the shape of the mouth. You can see all of the landmarks indicated on this photo and the position of those landmarks relative to each other is what's allowing the algorithm to say, we have this level of confidence that a particular emotion is being expressed. So all of your big tech providers, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, have developed these tools um, on their cloud platforms, very accessible from a pricing standpoint. There are also separate um, standalone companies that have emerged providing this type of technology. You know, another thing that we can use, one of the metrics that we derive is the density of the photo or the density of the image. So how crowded is the image? And what you see on the left, images of, of that have low object density. So for example, in this image of a bas basketball player, we have the athlete, we have the basketball in the image of the lipstick, we just have the lipstick and its cover. Whereas if you look at our examples of the high object density images, yeah, you know, we have multiple people present. In this case, we've yeah, you know, we've got cars in one of the images, we've got patio furniture or lawn furniture in another image. And they're just much more crowded images. The more crowded the image, the more energy, the more effort it takes us mentally to process that image and make sense of it. And the more effort it takes us, as you can imagine, it might uh, detract from how likely people are to engage in that very crowd with that very crowded image. And so all of these automated techniques we can incorporate into our analysis. And so that's if we're looking at images, if we're looking at text, what if we're looking at videos? Yeah. Brands are posting a lot of videos online and we're seeing platforms like TikTok uh, and Clubhouse that are developed that take advantage of richer media. Well, the best analogy I can give you when it comes to thinking about how we can think about a video, think about it as a flip book. All right. It is a sequence of images that are moving at a particular rate. And so what that allows us to do, and I'm just going to stop if I can, um, and that flip book of images, that's going to be paired with an audio track. And so what we can look at is variables like visual pacing, variables like how quickly are these images changing? Is it a slow rate of change visually? Is it a fast rate of change visually? Just like we would look at the audio tempo, we can look at the visual tempo. We can look at fluctuations in the volume, fluctuations in pitch. We can look at similarly, we can look at fluctuations in the, in the visual component of the image. And so what a team of us had done is we collected videos from, I want to say approximately six or 700 brands on Facebook over a five-year period. And we said, well, let's analyze these videos. Again, using all an, um, automated tools that are commercially available. And let's see how important different pieces of the content are in terms of getting that content to be engaged with by consumers. And so the first, so we've got a number of studies that are ongoing with this, but the first one that we did was to look at what we refer to as tempo variation. That is, how quickly does the tempo, um, how frequently or how quickly does the tempo change in the audio? And so we looked at a number of different uh, factors here. So we looked at decibel variation, so the volume. We looked at the average tempo as a potential effect. We looked at brand personality measures. There are 46 different dimensions of brand personality, and one of them is brand excitement. And 
what you see on the x-axis in each of these plots is the our measure of tempo variation. And with the exception of brands that have very low excitement, what we consistently see is that the higher the tempo variation, the more you change the tempo of the audio, the less the, the post tends to be engaged with. And the reason for that is physiological. Uh, you know, my collaborators who had kind of dug into this literature had found that the audio processing, the way that we process audios in, in the brain, again, it requires that substant substantial amount of effort that it kind of interferes with other pieces of information that might be coming across. So the text that's being spoken, the visuals that are being used, the more, think of it as the more complex you make the audio, it generally doesn't do as well. People are less likely to engage with it. So if your goal is, I want eyeballs, the more eyeballs I get, the more opportunities that I have um, to, to sell, well, don't make the audio more complex than it needs to be. That, and that's going to hold for volume fluctuations. You see that holds for the tempo itself. The only moderator we find that reverses this pattern is if your brand is seen as one that's not particularly high energy, um, that's not particularly exciting. In that case, you might want to infuse more complexity into, into your videos because that's going to capture people's attention. Okay. Uh, with the couple of minutes that I've got remaining before we open things up for a QA, um, you know, one thing I want to talk about, because I think this is a huge space for marketers and it has the potential to significantly disrupt how we typically do things from what's what at least I would consider the creative side of the field. Uh, some of you may have heard about language models like GPT-3 or GPT-2 coming out of a company called OpenAI. Well, what language models are, think of these as teaching a computer to be able to speak English. What they do is they feed in massive amounts of text. Um, GPT-3, just to give you an idea, um, Wikipedia, is a sample, is a fraction of its data. It only accounts for, I think, about 3% of all the documents that are used to train this model. All right. So they've used blogs, they've used company websites, they've used news articles, uh, they use Wikipedia to understand the sequence of words. So, for example, in this particular example, if the computer sees what goes around, it's going to try to say, when I see that sequence of words, what's the next word that is likely to be generated? What's the next word that I commonly see with that sequence? And it goes through um, you know, massive computations in order to build this model. Here's the good news for, for marketers. These models have already been built. So OpenAI has partnered with Microsoft to make the, the latest version of their tool um, available through an API interface. Uh, and I've seen examples of it being used to generate social media posts, to generate search engine advertising, uh, and to build chatbots. And we're getting to the point where it's becoming more and more difficult to distinguish what's written by a human from what's created by the machine. Um, and if you don't believe me, I'll show you an, um, an example of this um, that we had generated. Right? So what we had done in a recent project is to say, well, if the computer knows how to speak English, how to write text, can we train it to create a first draft of search engine optimized content? So what we had done was to say, all right, suppose we have a keyword. Let's take the top performing Google results, the first page of Google results, and assume that is the ideal form of text, at least in the eyes of the search engine. We then said, let's retrain the model to not speak English. We want it to speak what we, you know, we want it to speak Google's language. That is, we want to train it to create text that is as similar as we can make it to the current top performing search engine results. 
Um, now, we also build in a penalty term there because we don't want it to be too similar because then it just looks like we've copied the text and Google is going to demote your, uh, your performance based on that. So once we've built our model, we generated a thousand pieces of hypothetical text and we scored each of those pieces of content. And we've done this with two different companies. We're actually in the process now of doing pilot studies with a number of companies where we give them the computer generated text and say, hey, we wouldn't post this online, but what you, what you should do with this text is use it as a starting point. Um, to give you a sense, it's, re it's reduced the effort needed to generate a piece of search engine optimized content for one of our partners from two hours for a piece of content to about 30 minutes. So dramatic reduction in terms of the amount of effort that it takes, but more important than that is, besides the cost reduction, we see better performance. So we ran a field study with this company where it said, let's put our machine generated human revised content onto the web. And what the gray bars show you are how many times did it rank in the top, th top 30 pages? The black bars show you how many times it ranked on the first page of search results. So the first plot is for our machine. The second plot that you see the real SEO experts is we asked, you know, um, we asked SEO experts who do copywriting for a living to create content. And we had a bake off. We said, well, let's see whose content performs better. And the machine created content um, actually ranks on, uh, ranks on the first page more frequently. This was for a B2B service provider. We've done it for an educational institution um, in Europe. And we're, we're, we're testing it for others. But what we're seeing, again, not that the human being is, is fully replaced. We're saying we can give the human a first draft. Right? Uh, and we can shave off a lot of the time. So in, the, in our example, the time that it took someone to write a piece of SEO optimized content, they could have edited four pieces of content. And what you see on the right-hand side of the screen, this is text that came from the machine. Now, it's certainly not perfect, right? There are multiple places where we've got errors. So for example, you see here, it repeats the word maintenance uh, multiple times. Uh, you know, there might be some punctuation that's off. Um, you know, there's some phrasing like, you have a specialist IT support specialist. So again, you know, there are some phrases that need to be edited, but this gives you a starting point. We're not starting from scratch. Now, just as we're seeing this happen for text, we're seeing it happen for images. So what you see on the right is a program that NVIDIA created that said, okay, give me a doodle. You know, this is something that my kids might create and it ends up on the refrigerator. But they trained this model based on artwork and said, all right, on the right side of that graphic, you see, this is what it, it looks like. If we kind of take the style of artwork and revise the doodle based on what the computer has learned. So, you know, just think about the ability to develop more content that could be pushed out, more content that can be customized. Uh, the other images that you see up here is, think of this as image autocomplete. So just as computers have now been able to autocomplete our text messages um, and our emails for us, we can now autocomplete images based on what it starts with. Um, one, I think what, yeah, the merger of these things is using text to generate images. And that's what you see on the bottom right here. So here's a text prompt, an armchair in the shape of an avocado. And then the algorithm that was developed, uh, all of the, there are no pieces of furniture that actually look like armchairs in the shape of an avocado. These are all computer generated images where they found armchairs and then kind of modified them based on the text saying, we want it to be in the shape or the style of an avocado. So that's, what it, that's how it modified the images of armchairs and blended them with uh, the shape of an avocado. So there's a lot that can be done from an analytic standpoint to build these algorithms and ultimately to deploy these algorithms. You know, if I gave you a tool that said, we can rapidly develop 
hundreds or thousands of variants of images so that we can tailor the marketing content that is used for specific market segments or for specific individuals. So as the, I'm excited by this because I think there's tremendous opportunity to marry the art and science that's associated with marketing. All right, now, what are the potential downsides? Because there are downsides. Um, artificial intelligence, like the ones we've just uh, discussed, are known for reinforcing biases, right? They are only, these models are only as good as the data that is used to build them. So if the data is biased, the output is going to be biased, all right? So here are just a couple of examples, Google autocomplete, uh, making some relatively biased or vile um, auto-completions. Uh, Amazon trying to use AI for hiring. Well, what did it start to do? It st the AI learned the biases that the hiring team had previously had. Uh, one of the most recent examples, uh, I showed you the image autocomplete. Uh, fascinating study, but what happened was, what they done was they started with images of men's heads versus women's heads and auto-completed the rest of the image. It had a high tendency to put men in business suits and women in swimsuits. Again, reinforcing the biases that are already that already exist. So, as much as there's opportunity to leverage the technology that's out there to develop highly customized, highly uh, effective content, we have to be mindful of how we do this so that we don't reinforce these uh, these known biases. Um, one of the spaces that I'm, you know, that I'm actively working on and that I always bring up whenever I talk about artificial intelligence with folks is how do we fix it, all right? So a uh, collaborator and I are uh, starting to talk about just as we can use these models to create text, you can use these models to edit text. Well, can we create a, an algorithm that debiases marketing text? So, for example, we want to reduce um, specific gendered associations. Um, so uh, if you look at agency, uh, you know, the amount of control that people are depicted as having in language, men are often depicted even more in more active roles, women depicted in more subservient roles. Doesn't happen across the board, but there is that gendered association in text. So can we correct the model so that we can then debias uh, marketing copy, right? Something else that we have to think about is what's the impact on for business versus what's the impact on individuals? Uh, co a colleague and I have done some work on the impact of image manipulation. Uh, so Photoshopped images tend to be shared more. It's more engaging. That probably doesn't come as a surprise to anyone. Um, that it gets shared more. But what it also does is it evokes more negative emotions in the consumer and triggers more social comparison, more feelings of envy. And this is probably why you, we're starting to see countries regulate um, image manipulation. I forget which Scandinavian country it was, but one country recently passed a law saying images that are manipulated for commercial purposes have to be labeled as having the image manipulated. Right? You know, just as we can look at this at a micro level that we have to be mindful, we also have to be mindful of the macro level impacts. As I mentioned, high arousal content, people read it more, people share it more. Well, it also contributes to increased polarization and echo chambers. So do we necessarily want to say, I want to create high arousal content because it's going to be read more, because it's going to be shared more? Well, depending on the nature of that content, there are negative consequences that are associated with it. And so one of the things that we're actively looking at is how do we kind of combat this? How we say, all right, if this echo chamber has been created or if content is contributing to polarization, how do we unwind that? You know, th you know there's that saying that the genie's that you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Well, that might be true, but how do we prevent more content from contributing to that problem, All right? So 
that's all the question. That's all the material that I had that I wanted to share with you today. But I hope it was effective in showing you what's possible when we think about content and want to connect it uh, to performance, and ultimately, how do we connect that? To growth, so we've got some time um, that I'm going to turn off uh, yeah, the screen share. Um, if there are questions uh, that we have uh, from the audience, happy to take those. And there are, and there are, David. I um, Great. I can certainly see how the tools that you talked about um, can really be used in, 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 in new and novel ways to unlock demand uh, once you sort of can see opportunities and, and you've designed something. But I do wonder, does this, I suppose two things, does this create opportunities for say small organizations or does this just mean that the large organizations, the ones with, with the big budgets, um, and those that are really tech savvy are just going to be able to take off even further. Um, great before. question. Uh, great question, Nicola. And I hope that's not the case. Um, I, yeah, I remember I spoke with an agency in town, a, a friend that's at Profit Consulting. And yeah, they're working for your Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies to do things like customer experience management and marketing automation. But I'm also working with a handful of companies who say, hey, what about everyone else? Can we democratize th these types of tools and make them available to, you know, small, medium-sized businesses because, and this is something that, yeah, um, I think I, I've started to think more about um, coming out of the pandemic, you know, going through Virginia Highlands, we see, you know, stores that have shut down during the pandemic or stores that are, you know, really on the edge right now. And, you know, I've spoken with some of them, they're like, yeah, we want to do the marketing, but we, you know, we want to take advantage of these types of tools, but we don't have the budgets available to us right now. And I think there's, there's a misconception because a lot of what we're talking about doesn't necessarily require big budgets. Um, you know, my, my collaborators and I that are worked on the search engine optimization uh, project, we're in the process of trying to say, you know what? Um, I was surprised at the price of search engine optimized content at three to $400 per page. Um, and we're trying to say, okay, well, can we make this available not for free because you know you've got to, there's the cost of building and running these things, but can we make it available at scale um, to smaller businesses that don't have that budget? And I talked with a local business um, that was one of our uh, pilot partners, and I said, "I love this, and if you can make it a subscription where I don't have to think about this, I use it when I need it." So if you, he gave me a price point, he said, "If you can hit this price point." I can afford that and this is a no brainer for me. So that's one of the things that we're working on. But I work with another uh, partner on a lot of work using location insights to say, I'm, I have the ability to learn about my customers, learn about my competitors' customers. And they founded the company with that mission of saying, yes, we're gonna serve the Fortune 500 because let's be honest, that's gonna help cover our bills while we're a small startup. But what we want to do is we want to be able to offer the service to small and medium-sized businesses so that everyone has access to these tools. So that, that, that's, that's good to know. We can all, we can all uh, um, participate in, in potentially some new, new uh, ways to find growth and unlock that. I've got some questions in the okay. Q&A in terms of what metrics do you collect for brand assessment? Uh, is it based on objective and key results? And can you give an example of the brand indicators? Sure. So we've looked at this in a, a number of different ways. Uh, in some of the earlier research that I've done, uh, we, yeah, we, we looked at uh, offline brand tracking surveys. Uh, and that had become one of the kind of gold standards, if you will, for kind of tracking perceptions of the brand. And what we had found was through the appropriate analyses, uh, online comments, uh, online user-generated comments actually track very well with those on, uh, offline brand tracking studies. In fact, um, it's a leading indicator 
of offline, those offline brand tracking studies, um, just to make sure that we were actually picking up things that were appropriate. We also looked at financial performance. Uh, so we looked at changes uh, in stock price and were able to kind of validate that what we see online actually links up with the offline metrics. But yeah, again, gold standard is what's real. And when I started doing this work, I was incredibly skeptical of the online metrics. I thought it was just going to be noise. And I remember the first project we had done with this, uh, my co-author and I had said, oh, this is just going to be noise. It's going to reaffirm the use of brand tracking surveys. And at the time, what we said, real data. And I had a conversation with her. I said, Wendy, well, I got, I've got the results, but we need to rethink how we think about this because it was the exact opposite of what we expected. Wow. Uh, but you know, I, this is one of those cases of test but verify. You know, collect the online metrics because it's a lot easier, it's more accessible, um, but don't take it at face value until you've, uh, until you've done that. You say, I got this many likes, I've got this many comments, this many shares. That's great, it's helping you build an online audience, are you seeing an uptick in customer traffic? Are you seeing an uptick in sales? That's ultimately what we're interested in. Absolutely. But the question here around, um, you know, do facial landmark AI tools work effectively across racial and cultural profiles? Is it cross-referenced against the facial landmarks of target audience respondents as they watch the ads? You know, that's, that's a great question. Um, facial recognition, again, like everything else that we've found, is known to be biased. Uh, it works best for white males. Uh, I, 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 I'm forgetting the exact ordering, but I believe it works worst for African-American females. Um, and so this is solely a reflection of the data that's been used to build these models. And so this is one of those active pursuits saying, now that we know that it has a problem, we need to collect a more representative sample. And that's what these commercial vendors are starting to do to say, let me collect you know, wider range of ages, wider range of um, races, be better mix of genders so that we don't have that same problem. And the way that they're training these models is exactly what was suggested in the comment was, um, you know, let's have them watch these ads. Let's see how they're reacting in real time. So not only um, the company that I mentioned that does this copy testing, not only are they collecting facial expressions, they're also collecting metrics like skin temperature, um, which is something that's been linked to arousal. Mm -hmm. So does that really mean that non-structured data isn't really ready for prime time? I mean, it... it... I push back on it because... It, it depends, you know, it, it, let's look at it more, instead of a binary, is it ready or not? Let's look at it as a continuum of, you know, there's kind of the most primitive version and then there's kind of the whiz bang, fully polished product. Mm -hmm. And again, the one I'm closest to is the SEO pro, um, generation project that we had done um, because I'm actively working on it. Um, it's ready for prime time in the sense that we can manually run it. It's not ready for prime time in the sense that we have the website built so that you can sign up, enter your search, the term that you want to rank for, and it's going to automatically spit it out for you. But if we take some of the image analysis, um, you know, this is work that one of my collaborators uh, is doing, and I ask him again, and you know, I'm not going to claim to be the, you know, the expert at computer science because I didn't go to school for that, but he did. And so I, I trust him when he tells me, I say, you know, we're talking about, let's say we're talking about analyzing a million images or videos and scaling up an algorithm so that you drop in your image, you drop in your video, and we can tell you how it's going to perform. And he tells me for someone of his skill set, basically, if you had a full time PhD data scientist doing this, it's done in a couple of months. Um, now, finding those people, hiring them, no small task. And so I think that's where you're seeing a lot of startups start to emerge where we can say, okay, can, we, can that company build something, take it to scale, put it in the cloud so that it can be done at a price point that is accessible to everyone. Um, and I think absolutely where that's on the horizon. Um, I think you're going to see rapid progress on this over the course of the next year. Um, and yeah, this is one of the reasons I'm, I'm happy to be in Atlanta because that tech talent, you're seeing 
lots of companies coming in, come into town looking for that talent. And so we're seeing a big entrepreneurial tech scene um, emerge in the city. Right. And I think, I mean, this, this underscores why we're having, we're, we're developing the Growth Leadership Academy, because it's these sorts of questions, uh, these sorts of tools that people need to be, to sort of upskill and understand and the questions behind it in terms of it's not just press a button and go right. because you could create all sorts of, of hazards for your organization. you got to be smart about what you do, how you think about this, the biases in, in it. So it's not just a, uh, it, it, it's more than turning on, you know, it's not like Excel, right? That you just right, learn right. it and go. And, um, it, no. and there's this, a this real is one of those spaces like that, that again, again, we have to be mindful of it. We're learning as we go. Um, but one thing I did want to, to, to make clear is, again, you know, I mentioned that computer scientist with who has you know, years of study in order to do that. There are versions of image analytics, let's say, where it is, it's not going to be as sophisticated a methodology, but there's open source software that's out there that can say, analyze this image for me, report back a series of analyses based on that image. I can then take that, incorporate it into other analyses to see how it links up to sales. So while the most sophisticated methods might be out of reach for the time being, there are open source tools like that that are readily available. But again, as you mentioned, it's knowing what those tools are, understanding how you use those tools. Right. We've got um, time for just one um, more question. Probably don't actually have time for one more question, but I'm going to ask you it anyway. Have you seen any correlation to sales from your studies online and offline? Uh, would there be a difference, any difference that drives sales, or do you think that what you studied would apply to sales? In terms of marketing content driving sales, mm -hmm. you know, we've seen, so in the very early days of content analysis research, when we were just looking at things like valence, we have seen a link between kind of the valence of comments and sales. Um, so yeah, it, more recently, again, what, what we're seeing, I um, a lot of the social media research looking at images, um, has linked it more toward the metrics that were readily available, like sh number of shares, um, number mm -hmm. of views. Um, and so, yeah, that's where kind of research runs, it runs into a barrier of, we, get, we do the research based on what's available to us. We can speculate on what we would expect to happen by stringing together you know, different things that we found. But this is why we're always open to partnering with companies that want to take the, these ideas put them into practice so that we have that complete, uh, you know, that more holistic view of the entire system. Right. Well, thank you so much, uh, David. This is really fascinating. And, you know, part of that sort of rich tapestry um, of insights and research and content um, that goes what a faculty bring to us um, and that will underpin, uh, that is underpinning that Growth Leadership Academy that we are developing. So I encourage uh, anybody on the, 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 the webinar to uh, investigate that uh, on our website. So I'm going to turn over to Pam. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Nikolai. Thank you, David. We've had so many great comments coming in to the chat, um, lots of engagement. So I hope you'll have a chance to look at that before we close. Very quickly before we end today's session, just want to highlight the upcoming sessions for Business Over Breakfast in September. Um, on September 2nd, we are welcoming back Anandi Bardwatch for a continuation of business model innovation. And then on September the 16th, the stories we tell ourselves and what those stories tell us. And it's about overcoming our own immunity to change. As we shared earlier this month in our uh, first Business Over Breakfast webinar, we are excited about the uh, back to school special we're offering, if you will, for our upcoming open enrollment courses and invite you to go to our website to check out those courses for um, uh, uh, individuals. And uh, Justin, your main screen is showing instead of the PowerPoint. Uh, so you could just stop sharing for a moment. Uh, but again, the, in the chat at the beginning of the webinar was a link to our website. And then I also want to invite you to check out specifically 
our courses for organizations when you go to the Emory Executive Education website and check out more about the Growth Leadership Academy that Nicola introduced at the front end of our webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today, taking time out, you know, the first and third Thursdays of the month. And we invite you to answer just a shortened couple of questions on our closing survey at the end of the webinar. Thanks so much and have a great rest of the day.